want to welcome you guys uh, and our listeners to this and ongoing uh, virtual session. This captures normally what we would be doing at the Javits Center at um, New York at the Interfect Show. Uh, it's usually a live session, as you know, and we all sit in uh, the Crystal Palace there and uh, discuss these topics. Reed and their foresight has uh, decided to go virtual with this so that the continuity and the material is out there for our colleagues that would customarily be coming into the Javits Center in New York City. Today, uh, we have a, a first time for our uh, uh, live session, and we're going to be talking about the uh, medical isotopes and the industry perspective on that. Um, we had the privilege today of having Daryl Spector, who's the president of Promation Nuclear. I get that one right, Daryl. Good. Correct. All right. Right. Brian Hayes, Director of Life Science at Grand Tech. I get that one right? I hope. Yes. Yeah. All right. And Travis Bassinger, Technical and Business Director at Medical Isotopes for Kinetics. Is everybody good with that one? So I think we got that. We're ready to go. Just as background, fellas, um, the reason and one of the things that uh, the Reed people and I really felt strongly about having this session was uh, in a prior life many years ago when I was an undergraduate, uh, you know, we studied radio pharmacy in school. This was this was something that you guys, I'm sure, are familiar with. At the time, ER Squibb was probably the leading industry, you know, and one of the things that we did was they would allow us to come and uh, work in their lab, obviously with the inert, uh, the inert systems, but nevertheless, that was how we got trained. However, things have come a long way, and in my opinion, it's, uh, in discussion with several of our colleagues, we felt it was imperative that we want to hear what's going on. So let's see. I got so what I'm thinking here is so let's you know we're all here talking about pharmaceutical manufacturing, and we always talk about biotech, and we talk about molecules, big molecules, small molecules. Everybody, everybody has a pretty good sense of that. However, gentlemen, I'd like to I'd like to bring everybody up to date. You know, radio pharmacy, radio pharmaceuticals. You know, what are the products, and you know, how do you make them? Uh, I think people, you know, it's kind of gotten. Like, I think we got to put a, a big bright light on that. So, Travis, so why don't we walk? Why don't you walk us through this? What is the industry? What are the products? How do you make them? That kind of stuff. So we can get started. Yeah, thanks, Russ. Um, so, you know. The radio pharmaceutical industry, as you've mentioned, this is this has been around for a long time. Um, it's not as though this has just come up over the past number of years. However, it's gotten a lot of attention over the last number of years in terms of some big transactions in the industry, big pharma's coming in and they're um, recognizing the value of some of these products. So, so what is uh, you know what is a radio pharmaceutical? How are they different? Um, so. They're a whole class of drugs typically used for either imaging or therapy. So on the imaging set uh, standpoint, um, this is a pretty day-to-day -day procedure. If you've had family members that have gone in for a stress test or a cardiac test, um, chances are they're getting a SESTA-maybe scan. And this is with technetium 99M, kind of one of the most prominent and widely used radioisotopes. Um, and really where we're seeing a lot of action today is in the therapeutic realm. Um, the therapy, therapeutic use of radio pharmaceuticals, again, has been around for decades. But we're getting into more targeted therapies now, which has added a lot of excitement. Um, so this industry is global. It's got a very complicated supply chain. Um, and it's got a lot of unique differences to traditional pharmaceuticals. So I think we're going to have a pretty interesting discussion today be able to you know educate some of our uh, our um, community on on really what the differences are and what our challenges are so travis i mean you mentioned a few things about imaging and stuff but i mean these these products are pretty exciting you hear a lot about them and you know where are they where 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 are the really where the groundbreaking and new areas that, that the isotopes are being used today yeah so if you go back um you know probably about half a decade ago or maybe a little longer Really, the one of the biggest um, new drugs to hit the market was a product called Zofago, and this was developed by um, a company, a little Norwegian company um, out of Oslo called Algeta, and it was a very, very simple product. It was simply a radium uh, 220 or 223 um, radionuclide, so radium chloride salt, 
And uh, this product simply is a calcium mimetic. So it seeks the bone and can be used to treat metastases. So if you have um, uh, generation of ab you know abnormal growth of cells in 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 the bone, this um, this product seeks that same area of growth, mimicking calcium, and it imparts its radiological um, impact or damage to those cancerous sites. Now, this wasn't the first time this is done. There's other products. There's Metastron. There's um, which is sumerium, uh, or sorry, uh, strontium-90, there's Quadramet. So there's other pharmaceuticals in this space that have been around for a while. But what added a lot of excitement and why uh, actually Bayer came in and, and bought Algeta for a very large sum of money was this was the first time an alpha-emitting radiopharmaceutical had gotten through phase three trials and, um, and was on its path to getting approval. And alpha emitting radiopharmaceuticals are very interesting. They have, opposed to some of the beta particles that have been used for treatment in the past, where you get one emission of um, a, radiolog or a, a radiological output, like an electron in this case, you're getting multiple decays and you're getting larger particles. You're getting alpha particles emitted. And what this does is it, it concentrates the amount of dose um, going to that site and you get much better impact. So rather than just getting bone palliation, um, you're actually getting greater overall survival. And this really, I'd say this single drug re-energized the entire industry. And uh, since then we've seen a number of uh, big pharma players get involved. So another European company, uh, AAA was bought by Novartis because they wanted to get their access to a drug called Lutathera, a lutetium-based targeted radiopharmaceutical for neuroendocrine tumors. And since then, really what's created probably the, the most interest, the most hype, is a drug going through, or actually now finished phase three trials, um, called PSMA-617, another lutetium-based drug. Uh, Novartis also added that to its portfolio um, a couple years ago through an acquisition of a company called Endocyte. And of course, prostate cancer, big, big indication. And if you look at the clinical data around this drug, uh, huge impact to patients. Um, it really shows great promise. So there's a huge amount of excitement around drugs like these, the moving into targeted um, pharmaceuticals, targeted radiopharmaceuticals. So, you know, like I, I was saying before, I mean, you know, when I, when I was a student, uh, we never actually got to uh, work on anything actively. You know, I mean, we got that. So, and my entire career has been spent in small molecules and some time in large molecules. And there's always facility considerations and safety considerations and things, things have become, as potency goes up, things become even more difficult. So uh, the question I got for you, Daryl, I mean, considering the potency, considering what radioisotopes are, I mean, let's talk about the production facility. I can only imagine how difficult and how challenging that must be. Can you touch on some of that for us, please? Yeah, sure. I think uh, I can comment on the, we're, we're involved in a couple of programs right now that is facilitating the startup of new production facilities for radio pharmaceuticals. We come from a nuclear background and we're not uh, necessarily uh, uh, pharmaceutical. So, but there's commensurate, um, competencies from a high compliance threshold industry. So we appreciate that side of things, but we, then we also partner with companies like uh, Grand Tech, and that's why it's great having Brian here because they understand the GMP methodology. So that nexus of radiological considerations coupled with uh, pharmaceutical is, uh, it's a compounding effect of the respective considerations, but they're also in the same vein, also, uh, uh, you know, mutually, um, considered it, consider it as well. So from a handling point of view, from an isolation point of view, there's common grounds there. But then you have the added consideration of shielding and, uh, you know, ALARA, which is as, as low as reasonably allowable. So if there is going to be radiological fields coming off of some of these uh, radiopharmaceuticals and generators and so on, how do we use robotics? Where typically it might be a manual intervention, where because of the lack of fields in a conventional pharmaceutical application, you know, you have a manual handling tool or a manual operator there because now because of the added element of potential of fields from uh, the radiological uh, um, aspect or characteristic of the isotope, you need to have remote handling, remote transfer, and so on. In addition to the added shielding, 
which has mass and weight considerations. So I think from a, a process point of view and the actual mechanics of equipment, uh, it's more around that consideration of the um, increase on automation, robotics, remote handling, and shielding primarily. Uh, I'll defer you know, to Brian or Travis to comment on the uh, you know, broader process side, but from my perspective, from the radiological considerations, those are the key elements that I'm familiar with uh, in radio pharmaceuticals versus conventional pharmaceuticals. Brian, why don't you uh, talk about that, what you guys been doing at Grand Tech? Yeah, so we come from, you know, as Daryl mentioned, more of a pharmaceutical, uh, both small molecule, large molecule background. Um, but but working with uh, working with Daryl, we've, we've gotten more into the uh, the radio pharmaceutical uh, space recently. But we, you know, we as Grand Tech, we are a solution provider, software developer. So we we are always looking for new ways to to implement novel technology. And one one area that I think we're you know we're looking to explore is to uh, to talk about or to look at you know the use of simulation and, and digital twin and designing some of this equipment and some of these facilities. And on the process side, you know I you know I come from a process automation background. You know, we've we've done a lot of work in in you know large molecule process you know where you know concept like uh, sterility aseptic manufacturing. Um, uh, terminal sterilization are you know fairly common and so we leverage those uh, techniques and tools you know from from large molecule uh, production in you know the process uh, elements and process design uh, for uh, for radio pharmaceuticals as well so you know, so Daryl why don't we um you know we were talking about process and I think the the point here is that the, the equipment itself the design of the equipment uh, must I think we need to talk about that just a bit because what I'm hearing is is you know there's certain shielding but it sounds like there's some common places but there's also some unique situations so in the design aspect for equipment what does that look like? so I, I think uh, there's a number of considerations in the, in this regard so uh, my my feeling is that generally volumes are not as substantial as they are in bulk pharmaceutical manufacturers so conventionally life science pharmaceutical manufacturer it is high volume, high speed automation because you also have a higher shelf life as well. So you can really produce things in batch and they don't have the shelf life. The, 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 one of the major considerations with radio pharmaceuticals is that because of the various types of, of different radio uh, isotopes uh, with the different half-lives is that there is a lot of just-in-time um, considerations. So batch size uh, plays a big factor as well as the uh, turnkey process handling so it can actually get processed with the right volume out the door and shipped so it still has the efficacy that is expected from that radioisotope. Uh, so process uh, considerations themselves are quite different from that aspect, but you still have to maintain the uh, GMP and FDA considerations as well. And then in addition, just a lot more around remote handling and also reliability. There's a big focus on reliability because in the event we've designed a system and uh, for any reason, you know, there's always different kind of failure modes that you consider, but where there is not a high toxicity consideration and the system seizes or, or, or breaks down or something, you can typically go in there with the hazmat considerations and go and fix it. But with the radiological considerations, you can't. So there's also a very strong additional layer of focus on reliability, on redundancy, and so on, because of the added risk hazard of the radiological consideration. Uh, so not only is there an increase for remote handling, remote applications, uh, automation where possible, but also additionally, a high uh, reliability and redundancy where possible. And then you add that shielding into it as well. So now you've got these big, you know, heavy, thick, added elements of just the system design that just adds a bulk to the overall system uh, as well. So if you have a shielding door that you need to open between the hot cell, you know, it could be a thicker shielding door that requires, uh, you know, stronger handling because of the inertia moment when that door comes open or you have to close it and things like that so with the telemanipulators and, and so on. So to me, those are the uh, kind of the, the underlying um, 
major considerations in equipment design when considering a radio pharmaceutical application versus a conventional pharmaceutical? I could no, do uh, uh, Go ahead. Um, go ahead, Brian. Sorry, I was gonna I was gonna say if I could expand on more of the supply chain side of things. I know we talked a little bit around how you know, radio pharmaceutical production, the short half-life products. It's kind of similar to, to CAR T therapy where the patient and chain of custody and chain of identity is very important in the supply chain. And I wonder if Travis may want to expand on, on that uh, factor. Sure. And, you know, I think, uh, you know, Daryl and Brian put some good points out there and supply chain is very sophisticated. Um, you know, batch sizes was brought up um, in this realm, even a large commercial batch of radio pharmaceutical product might only be, you know, a few hundred vials of product um, at a time, but you're looking at making multiple batches in a given in a given week to be able to keep the flow of product, which is always decaying on you um, hour by hour. So there's always this juxtaposition between, um, you know, managing that supply chain and keeping the product safe and keeping the people safe. And often those those two elements are actually fighting to each other in terms of how you design your equipment or facility. Um, the other thing is that these products are are really made in a continuum. So you're starting with raw materials. You actually have to make your drug substance and your drug product in the same facility. Um, there's no, you know, making a batch of your drug substance that goes through quality control testing. You have QA release and maybe it transports to another, you know, area of the world. Um, in this case, it's all done in, in a straight line. So it, from an equipment standpoint, you need to have, um, you know, your equipment organized very efficiently to allow transfers of your drug substance and drug product um, operations to be close in proximity. Um, and then you have a lot of uh, elements of uh, sterility assurance control between this. Most of these products are parental products, a large bulk of them. So, you know, from a, a filling standpoint, um, you have to be very careful, you know, even though you're filling a small number of vials, um, you can't have any drips of product. Um, if you contaminate the inside of your hot cell, um, then you know you're not going to be able to go through batch change over rapidly as you may need to. You'll have a decontamination procedure to go through. So that can interrupt the supply chain and your your rhythm of supply. I mean, even in terms of looking at sterile processing, most of the times um, for finished radio pharmaceuticals, you can't terminally sterilize. They have to be uh, through a sterile fill. Um, so even considerations of airflow, if there's any aerosolization or volatile nature of your product, you can't have that air passing over your product twice. Otherwise, you may contaminate everything, the exterior of the vials. So there's uh, a lot of unique attributes of, of how to manage air in these facilities, not just in the equipment and isolators, but actually throughout each um, stage of, um, of the facility managing kind of air sinks and air bubbles to make sure that products and people are, are keeping safe. From the CAR-T perspective, I think that's a good example is, um, you know, these products are very customized, very personalized, um, and you could have a total time frame from this time you start making the product to the time it is manufactured, filled, quality control and out the door of, maybe 24 hours or 36 hours. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done. Um, so everything you design into your process needs to be extremely well orchestrated um, and uh, so that products are released on time. The supply chain's gotta be real. I mean, you don't make your lives any, make your lives difficult here for sure. So it's gotta be uh, a septic process, a septic fill just-in-time subject supply chain. So how do you plan that, Brian? I mean, how do you guys deal with something like that? How do you plan? How do you figure out what you're gonna do? Yeah, I mean, you know, with with our experience in biologicals is kind of an analogy to the radio pharmaceutical world where, you know, there's a lot of aseptic filling, aseptic processing, you know, sterilization of the equipment and, you know, beforehand sterile filtration, you know, as you're, as you're, uh, you know, going from step to step and from from raw material through to through the finished product, and so we we actually do do a lot of uh, work with our customers around 
uh, optimizing optimization and efficiency of their their manufacturing processes. So we implement uh, you know tools such as manufacturing execution systems to help orchestrate the the activities that that are going on and as as the processing steps uh, continue on. And you know because I know there are a lot of uh, a lot of other biological products that we we work with that that have a similar you know where the yield of your end product actually decreases as time goes on, similar to uh, similar to a half life, but more around like you know like proteins denature as time goes on. So so we help them you know in a similar way that we would help a radio pharmaceutical customer by uh, by introducing these efficiencies. So but Travis, so let's just so if you can't build inventory, how can you predict? that you're going to have what's required to deal with your patients. I mean, you know, how do you how do you deal with it? I mean, supply chain depends on demand and demand depends on, you know, people and patients. So how does that work? How far down does it go? Yeah, Russ, it, it really does back up to the very uh, each each end of the supply chain. So probably two elements to, to talk about here. The first is is the communication of demand all the way back to the production of the isotope. And then there's the stability and robustness of each step in the supply chain. So on the first point, um, really what I think the industry needs is a, a very good IT infrastructure vendor that can start really in the physician's office where when, um, a dose of product is needed, that can be entered into a system. And then that can be channeled along to the drug manufacturer, so that they can understand on a weekly basis how much product they need to manufacture and not be wasteful, and also have you know the adequate amounts for add-on orders and um, and you know understanding the decay chain and all of this too, because the manufacturer the drug product may be shipping product from, for example, the United States to all areas of the world. Um, you know it can be as far as Australia um, into Europe. So each one of those vials needs to be calibrated to the right amount of radioactivity for when it gets to the patient. So there's there's a lot of sophisticated algorithms that need to go into that. And then, you know, going one step back from that, and this is where Kinetrix is deeply involved, is ensuring that the isotope production itself at the nuclear reactors or perhaps at cyclotrons for other products um, is ready to serve that demand as well. Because again, that's a little bit further back in the supply chain. And you know you, you can't just turn on the tap and have isotope being produced. Um, there's again a lot of logistics, a lot of controls that need to be made to produce isotopes. And that kind of leads into the next part of the supply chain is the robustness. So um, if you go back not too many years ago, there was a lot of noise and activity in the industry surrounding the availability of of the most world's most important radioisotopes. Um, Canada was involved in this. Of course, Chalk River was producing uh, a huge amount of isotopes uh, for the world. And when they had the interruption at the reactors and now eventual uh, wind down of those operations, this was a big disruption in the supply chain. So it was, it was really the very first step. And now we don't have the supply of isotope to go into these products, uh, which we need to, to convert into drugs. So here at Kinetrix, um, as well with our partners, Bruce Power, Framatome, we've formed a, a joint venture called Isogen, and we'll be setting up uh, the first power reactors here in the world at Bruce Power to produce uh, medical isotopes on a, a grand scale. And the other unique thing here is that what we're aiming to do with this specific venture is for the first time we'll have multiple nuclear reactors at a single site able to produce isotopes and that builds in the redundancy in the supply chain that's needed because if one reactor is, is on need service or is in an outage for some reason you are not left empty-handed in terms of the isotope supply so this is for uh, isogen kinetrics and framatome as well as bruce power um, really key to strengthening the supply chain right at the very base of the industry. And of course, that transcends down at the manufacturing plants. They need that redundancy to make sure that product gets to the patients when it's needed. We bring up a lot of, you know, speaking on behalf of some of our uh, 
attendees and colleagues here. You know, we're trying to get our heads around the whole thing. I mean, we're talking about nuclear reactors. We're talking about, you know, heavy shielding. Um, you know, we're, you're in an industry where we worry about, you know, manufacturing practices and good manufacturing practices. And to be honest, sometimes we find that, you know, the Fed regulations and what we expect, there's always seems to be a gap or a misstep. I mean, how do you guys come to grips with this thing? I mean, how do you maintain CGMP and stuff like that? So what I think, it, I don't want to dump, dump it all on you, Travis, but you start and Brian, you jump in when you feel comfortable. All right. How's that? Sure. Sounds good. Um, so, again, you know, spend a lot of time in the manufacturing realm for these products. Uh, GMPs are, are getting more, um, I don't want to use, more uh, demanding year by year. However, I don't think there's necessarily anything in the industry that can't be achieved from a technical or engineering standpoint. Um, these are problems that are solvable. I think the, the thing that makes it hardest for compliance is the speed of all of, of the processing. Um, because you're looking at producing a batch of product over over really hours um, and you know maybe a couple of days to make sure you're getting all the right checks um, the right level of quality control quality assurance oversight is really the most challenging aspect of compliance in the gmps in this space so again the where we still live in this industry in a very paper-based world um, and I think, you know, this is probably a good segue for Brian, you know, some of the IT infrastructure to help those handoffs from step to step, all, all the internal controls, the process controls, integrating them so product can be released rapidly and to the high quality that you need it is, is going to be key for the future. Yeah, I was, I was going to jump in there and, and talk a little bit around, you know, batch release and, and the requirements for more of a real time release. Uh, cycle rather than you know a traditional solid dose could be like you know multiple weeks after the batch is produced before it gets released for uh, to market um, because QA has to go through either a paper back record batch record um, or the electronic records um, so so having that uh, like like EBR with a real time release uh, the availability to do release by exception and to speed up the batch release is, is very, very key. Yeah. As well, that type of activity supports data integrity, which has been under you know, incredibly high scrutiny by the regulators over the last few years, um, especially in QC labs, uh, as well as on the manufacturing floor. So, uh, so and that's one area where, you know, where we've seen a lot of our customers come, come to us and you know, they've gotten, you know, whether they've gotten a 483 or they've just gotten, you know, you know, their internal audits bring up data integrity concerns, uh, going in there and help them introducing new uh, new technologies or new, uh, you know, sets of uh, of infrastructure or or even ways of doing uh, doing business to to help them alleviate the data integrity concerns. I mean, the same thing's got to hold for like specifications test standards i mean the, our industry's got we got all kinds of documentation i mean the infrastructure alone i mean there's the batch record which is intuitively obvious right i mean but then there's all the stuff that goes into all the other components so brian i mean how upstream are you going here I mean, how does this work well for us we we deal mainly with the manufacturing side so so batch records, cleaning records, but you know when a new facility or when a new piece of equipment is uh, is going to be installed, you know obviously there's the commissioning, qualification, validation aspects. Uh, you, know, you know typical GAMP, uh, you know URS, FS development. Um, you know so for us, you know we would we would consult at the front end to both on the operational. Uh, performance side of things as well as the you know assurance that uh, whatever these systems that are getting put in there are, are fit for for their intended use as required by you know by the FDA and, and other regulatory agencies as well you know um, yeah that's 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 you know essentially you know like I would say at the URS stage of a new uh, system would be where we you know jump in upstream like we're I wouldn't say we we get into the drug development, uh, you know, in the QBD 
of the actual drug product itself. But we start, you know, where the you know where the technology transfer jumps into the, the, the manufacturing space. So Travis, let me yeah, but, but having said all of that, if you say um, you know, there's an innovator company or even in my line of work, I get a chance to, to deal with some of the, you know, startup companies. I mean, what are regulatory challenges if you, you know, you can have a terrific idea with an absolutely perfect, um, you know, not perfect, but certainly a, a compound that you're going to be able to bring to market. I mean, what's the regulatory challenges? How do I get it from, how do I get from A to B? How do I get it out there? Do you go compounding pharmacy? What do you do? Yeah, really good question. And uh, for products in phase one or entering phase one, that's um, what a lot of innovative companies need to, to understand and decide is, is how to um, manufacture one of these products for a small trial and not have it really break their bank account because, you know, the you still need to be in compliance um, with the regulations, the CGMPs. Uh, but now you're dealing with making a batch of, of one like uh, quite literally one dose at a time um, custom made for the patient at a given given moment in time so you know i think the um being able to um utilize some of the uh, i guess they would be uh, concessions that the fda and health canada and other regulators allow for phase one products in this space um, and again, those mostly are on you know more simple areas, perhaps control of raw materials, um, have some some uh, some concessions, and are easier to do. But fundamentally, you still need to follow all the right um, steps in terms of making sure that product's safe. So you know you can't skimp on sterility assurance. Um, that's that's a, a given. Um, but you know, probably finding the right level of validation for these products in terms of, of how much uh, you know QBD quality by design work you want to do, um, what level your analytical methods need to be uh, developed and validated for, or areas where you can work with the regulators on that you know step by step approach as you go through the the stage of the clinical trials. Um, yeah, I just just. Brian, so that must mean you you do a lot of you you help these folks do a lot of risk analysis. I mean, I got to believe this is key to you, the way you guys do business. Yeah, for sure. You know, as as the you know CQAs of a product become CPPs, and we design you know control structures to to help uh, you know make sure CPPs are staying within their you know the boundaries to ensure product quality. And we're 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 looking at the um, you know the different uh, design elements of which ones are critical and ensuring that the uh, you know that we're basically mitigating any compliance risk or any quality risk by by you know whether it's adding more technical controls building in deeper procedural controls or uh, you know, or working with uh, you know folks like Daryl and Travis to make sure that the facilities and the equipment can can support the uh, you know those uh, you know, the, the insurance of, of CPP staying within their, you know, quality boundaries. So, Daryl, let's talk about that for a minute. I mean, what about, you know, for example, I mean, as engineering guys, I mean, what do you do to maintain, to hit these regulatory trade uh, goalposts? I mean, I mean, it's, there's got to be a lot of, it's like you said, I mean, your, your base industry, as I understood it, I mean, you, it's not radio pharmaceuticals, that, but radio, you know, this is your area. But my point is, how do you how do you bring all this to bear and obviously successful? Well, I think uh, through a, a number like an, as an engineer, we just like to build stuff. So the integration of different considerations is kind of something we get we kind of get a buzz out of as, as well. Uh, I think the interesting thing about this panel in particular is you've got uh, Travis, who's got a more of a chemistry background and comes uh, into a nuclear company like Kinetrix that understands the rigors of the complex rigors of operational considerations in nuclear plants for safety, licensing, analysis, and so on. So just by the very nature of the, of the uh, practice and the behavior, on the nuclear side, we're just well-versed because there's a very uh, diverse uh, and broad set of considerations for uh, compliance requirements in nuclear alone. So just uh, almost operationally and behaviorally and culturally in nuclear, we're very familiar with that. Uh, and then when we couple in with partners like uh, Brian and, and Grantech and so on that bring that GMP experience from the from the pharmaceutical side, 
we naturally know how to handshake already. So we know what we don't know, but we know how to integrate and address and identify the unknowns and appreciate the, uh, the motive and the rationale behind compliance requirements. So there's, there's an inherent uh, pre-existing appreciation of the need to integrate multiple elements and facets for a high compliance in the various elements of the, of the process, both in equipment reliability, uh, product tracing, quality for sure, um, and all those considerations. So it's just, uh, you know, it's one of those things, it's just, uh, you know, a horse of a different color, if you will. Um, but I think behaviorally and, and culturally and operationally, because of the high compliance industry, that's where there's commonalities to engage this kind of opportunity. Phil, let me ask you another. Let me ask you another question. Then, I mean, so obviously, and maybe I'm wrong, but I, I get a sense that this is an opportunity for power supply, power companies to partner with our industry. I mean, how do you handle that? I mean, is this something you see a lot? Or yeah, the the opportunity potential, I think, and and you know, Travis can speak to this as well. But uh, I mean, historically, the radio pharmaceuticals. Uh, quite often was driven by research reactors. And, and research reactors by themselves are not commercial entities. They are research reactors doing research and so on. And then there's discoveries being made on the um, clinical side of the benefits of various new developments and in innovations in isotopes and radiopharmaceuticals and treatments and so on. But, uh, you know, I think Travis had made the point before is that utilities are around to produce power. They are part of our critical infrastructure. As a society, we need power supply. So with the radio pharmaceuticals and the recent innovations going on for on power irradiation of a large scale reactor that justifies its existence as the infrastructure critical utility on providing power, but can then also play this hugely important social benefit to really facilitate and catalyze the, um, the growth of a radio pharmaceutical production on a larger scale that also has the sustainability of the power generation, unlike a research reactor, that there's one unit that can go offline for any number of reasons, unplanned maintenance, uh, being decommissioned because of a change in political policy, like there was at Chalk River. Um, you know, even for planned maintenance, and there's that sole supply, or the volume's not enough to meet the global demand. So the opportunity for the radio pharmaceutical market, not only from a uh, patient market side, from the clinical side, as um, medical practitioners start to understand more, and as the innovations in the radiopharmaceutical pharmaceutical space evolve on treatment side grows, so does the, the market demand, and then in turn puts a push on the supply demand. And so as power utilities can adapt and evolve to embrace and develop innovations that facilitate large scale on power irradiation of the radiopharmaceutical targets on the utility side, it really hits that perfect storm spot of a real sweet spot of opportunity because now you've got large scale production justified through energy supply, but also a growing market demand. So it really is a, a tremendous growth opportunity right now. And I think that's where companies um, like Bruce Power and OPG and so on can really start to embrace this. And, and then from the pharmaceutical supply side, um, you know, the big players in that space, if those two kind of Goliaths in their respective industries can really find a way to come together over time, it can have a very powerful, tremendous impact, both on the uh, clinical market supply side, but also just on the economy. Like you, you know, to, to think of collaboration between a, a nuclear power industry sector and a large-scale established pharmaceutical uh, industry and supply chain it has the potential to be quite profound on on so many levels. So Travis, what I we're gonna I'm gonna come to you, Brian, and well, Travis, can you build on top of that? To me, you know. Partner, these partnerships look like a, ter a terrific opportunity. On the flip side, you and I both know that once you have a system going, it's not like when I'm done, I turn off the lights and go home. So, you know, I mean, how do you do all this? So, so why don't you give us some insight? How do you do the partnership? And what, you know, obviously, this is where the opportunity lies. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I think a lot of interesting innovation always happens at the interfaces. So you get different uh, industries intersecting, and it may be the power industry and the radio and the pharmaceutical industry um, and you can build on the elements and strengths of each each partner um, you know for a company like Kinetrix um, extreme um, engineering prowess you know um, huge um, amount of expertise and safety analysis you have every engineering discipline you can imagine but the the topic is a bit different so 
um, I think all the engineering um, staff would speak the same language, but the specifics in terms of pharmaceutical design, what's needed, um, is just a different set of experiences. So when you get these people talking together, um, you can work out some pretty unique and individual uh, solutions to problems in the radiopharmaceutical space. Because now we have the radiological understandings, the safety of analysis, the, um, the understanding of how to work with radiation, and then the understanding of how to really work with a pharmaceutical product. And I think you need these types of partnerships for for success. Um, if you're a pharmaceutical company trying to take this on by yourself for the first time, um, I think you need to understand where your gaps in knowledge are. And again, from the pure um, engineering side as well, you have to understand where your gaps in knowledge are and then build on those um, those strengths. And if I can jump in for a second, I think that's a, that's a perfect example of, for example, the re relationship that Grand Tech and Probation have shared on a, a recent application is that, you know, we are uh, by nature a nuclear company and Grand Tech is, is a life sciences pharmaceutical more focused company um, with respective, you know, bias, ignorance in, in the, each other's known space. When we come together, there's a natural handshake. And so um, not only is there a tremendous opportunity for utilities and the pharmaceutical providers, but also for a lot of companies like us that are service providers in various disciplines on software, IT, data management, you know, equipment and so on. It creates a, a market demand and need where we can then apply our specific uh, competencies and service offerings as well. Um, so just through the the growth of this industry and this kind of uh, you know inflection point of of collaboration, it also creates a wake of other opportunities for the the tier ones and the tier two type uh, providers like ourselves. So just a, a huge economic prosperity uh, potential for this uh, collaboration. So Brian, where are we heading? What do you think? Sounds to me like, you know, you guys got some got a lot of some of the pieces figured out. So where are we going? What's the next big thing? Yeah, I mean from the technology side, you know, the pharmaceutical life sciences industry as a whole is really focusing on, you know, digitalization, you know, use of digital technologies to, you know, to both enhance quality as well as to uh, you know increase performance and so we're we're seeing a lot of uh, you know customers and potential customers look to us to guide them on their path to you know to the digitalization and digital transformation uh, arena so looking at you know how to how to implement things like robotics and collaborative robotics cobots um, looking at ways to, uh, you know, to, to run advanced analytics to do some more predictive or you know, almost, uh, you know, AI and machine learning based uh, um, technologies to, to help on both the, the operations, but to, to also do root cause analysis, um, you know, when there are deviations in the process or for predictive preventative maintenance. Um, so I think that you know, in and of itself of the, you know, of an in, the industry as a whole is going to trickle into the radio pharmaceutical subsector as well. Travis, yeah, so I wanted to get your take on that too, please. Yeah, thanks. So, um, you know, I, I'm really excited for the, the future in this industry. There's a lot of um, new products in the pipeline. I'm excited to see what new um, new isotopes may come into play and how these can benefit patients, you know. Um, there's, I think, a real opportunity here as suppliers and vendors in the space to make these products, medical isotopes and radiopharmaceuticals in general, more accessible for large pharma and general pharma to want to move into that space without them being um, perhaps hesitant or afraid to move into this kind of very bizarre area of, of pharmaceuticals. So if we can make that easy, make the supply chain robust, uh, take away some of the um, the obstacles that may prevent them from wanting to innovate more in this space, um, we'll see all sorts of new products for all different types of, of cancers um, start moving towards the market. So I hope through more collaboration and strengthening the supply chain, uh, we can see a lot of benefit to pharma and ultimately to the patients that are receiving these products. That's that's really the most important thing. 
Daryl, what do you think? Yeah, I, I think uh, carrying on that point, um, you know, one of the things we talk about in the nuclear industry is the, you know, the, the broader social benefit to the fact that we are contributing through the, you know, low carbon reliable base load supply of energy as an enabler to uh, phasing out greenhouse gases. So, that, so you know, culturally within the industry, we enjoy that that aspect to the consideration that, you know, we've helped to eliminate smog days in Ontario because we have a, you know, a 62 to 65, 68% on any given day a new for your supply and like overall i believe it's like 94 to 97 percent low or zero carbon energy production in ontario now through the also the potential of uh uh irradiation and supply of radio pharmaceutical production on a larger scale there's also that added social benefit of facilitating access and provision to market of life-saving medical um uh treatments in addition to other benefits like the sterilization that's really come to light with all of the COVID, for example. So if you look at all the cobalt 60 being produced in Ontario and how it's being used to sterilize, uh, you know, I forget the numbers. It's, it's a staggering number of the devices that I think the stats are like one in third, one in three medical devices used is being sterilized by cobalt 60 produced in Ontario. It's, it's those kinds of uh, intrinsic and sometimes intangible aspects that really make it touch home that the, um, the, the social implications and the real cultural implications, the societal implications of the work that we're doing here in um, driving this evolution of you know, the, the cross-section between pharmaceutical and nuclear does have a substantial, tangible, and tremendously important enabling impact on the overall benefit of quality of life uh, you know, in North America and globally. So, it sounds to me like there's opportunity abound. So is it is this just another question? And I, I direct this one at Daryl and Travis. And so does this mean that how much effort would it is it on the power company side to partner up, say, with the, to get into this into this, for example? Is there is there do they have to put a big stake in this or just give us a sense? In other words, if somebody was to approach um, public service, electric and gas here who's probably the biggest nuclear supplier around in this area. And you know, what would it take to partner with them? What would it take from their side so that you can get some something moving along? Just give us a sense of that. I think the corporate will needs to be there. So there has to be a strategic business case, uh, fundamentally, that the uh, operating utility and the, and the um, you know, executive guidance and the board and so on does see that this is an area of business they want to engage. If that will is there, that has to be something because it, in some ways, um, it can be considered a distraction to operating the utility, producing power, and so on. Um, so the strategic perspective needs to be very dialed in and very well aligned. And when that's in place, um, then that's where I think it shows a readiness on the utility side to then engage in handshake. Travis can comment. Um, you know, directly and intimately to what that relationship looks like because he's been involved in this through Isogen and the work that in partnership they have with with Frame, uh, Frameatome and Bruce Power. So, you know, th that's a, um, you know, probably best for Travis to comment on how that relationship actually does materialize. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, we're very fortunate uh, through um, through Isogen and um, our partners with uh, Frameatome, Kinetrix, Bruce Power, and, you know, Bruce Power made the strategic decision to move into medical isotope production, starting with cobalt 60 and now with lutetium 177. Um, so it, it's not a trivial step forward. There's a lot of, of um, impact potentially on reactor operations. So it's not easy to ease into this. Um, now, there's also technical considerations. And another big fortunate element of what we're doing here in Ontario is we have access to can do reactors. And not all reactors are actually capable of producing medical isotopes. Uh, they need to have a high enough flux. And CANDU reactors are actually uniquely constructed to do this. It, it wasn't by purpose, it's just by happenstance. Um, so the utility would also have to look at whether or not it's technically feasible to move into the space and then whether it aligns with operations. Um, so it's, yeah, there's definitely hurdles to enter in the space and you have to have the motivation to do so. Well, I, that was uh, quite the discussion, gentlemen. I mean, I've, it's obviously 
and I, I'm, I'm very glad we had this opportunity to put this out there in front of our colleagues and our um, people that come and look at the, th the discussion to learn. Um, people still, like I said, you know, people still remember the radio pharmacy stuff back 30 years ago, and it's come you know, an incredible distance. We've heard the ecological impact. We've heard the positive business impact, the collaborations. We've also we've also grounded it in the fact that hey, you know what? It is QED. It is quality standards and the parallels to to uh, the uh, cell and gene, and in particular CAR T, was uh, pretty much it. So you know, that's it. So what our challenge is that uh, we're going to move ahead. So I appreciate everybody's time. Brian, Daryl, Travis, thank you very much, and um, that's it. Thank you.